Welcome everyone, I'm Wendy Ratcliffe and I'm the Digital Dexterity Champion for La Trobe University. I've been part of the working group planning, organising and facilitating this Digital Dexterity Virtual Festival. Thank you for joining us on day four of our Championing the Call Digidex framework. Today's section of the framework focuses on collaboration, communication and participation. On behalf of the organising working group, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia and New Zealand where we meet today. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nation peoples and communities and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm on the land of the Jaja Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation here at the Bengo campus of La Trobe University. If you know the land you're on today, please share by adding it into the chat. A little bit of housekeeping. Can I ask that you all mute yourselves and turn off your cameras if you haven't already? If you're wanting to tweet throughout the event, please use the Digidex hashtag. We also have a newly launched blog. The details of both are in the chat. If you're attending the Design Thinking Workshop this afternoon, it's preferable that you do have your video on, bandwidth permitting. To look after you today, I have Liz, who will be facilitating chat and question time in Sarah Lambert's session, and Nika, Amika, Beck, Christine, Christina, sorry, Simone, Liz and Pauline, who will be helping out with Christy Newton's Design Thinking Workshop. If you have any technical or other questions throughout the session, please send a private chat message to Sarah Davidson and Caval, who will be able to help you. Today's session, we have, today's session will run as follows, sorry. We have Dr. Sarah Lambert, who is um, an honorary research fellow at the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning, and is currently the Chief Investigator of the Australian Scoping Study of OER. Sarah's talk, titled Designing for Inclusion, Insights from National OER Textbooks Research, covers the research and findings of her project. The project looked at the extent to which OER texts have to act as a social justice initiatives in the uh, Australian higher education sector. Whilst you're listening to Sarah's presentation, if you have any questions, can you please add them into the chat? These questions will then be asked at the end of the presentation. After Sarah's presentation, we'll have a small break. Please, if you're attending the next session and have not had time to look over the personas, can you use this time to familiarise yourself with them as they're key to making sure that the design thinking workshop is effective. When we return from our break, we'll be joined by Christy Newton. Christy is a digital literacies coordinator from the University of Wollongong and a DigiDex champion. Christy will take us on a whirlwind trip through the design thinking process where participants will apply the techniques to address the topic of OERs in higher education. This session will use breakout rooms and Jamboard as a collaborative tool. At the end of the session, we'll share a link to a Google poll. By answering the questions in the poll, you will, will help assist us in shaping future events and we hope that you can take the time to do so. So before we get started, I wanted to also thank the Digital Dexterity Champions Network, and in particular, Sarah Davidson and the Event Organising Working Group, who have helped make this event possible. So now to get into the session, first session, um, I'll hand over to you, Sarah. So introducing Dr. Sarah Lambert. Thank you very much, um, Wendy, and, and um, it's great to be here today. And I'm really looking forward to not only sharing the results of this research, which I hope will plant some really useful seeds um, uh, into, into your future practice and um, might in, even just um, provide a few bits of inspiration for the design workshop. And um, so I'm, I'm going to we have plenty of time for this, so I'm not going to race and there will be definitely some stop points where we can um, just check in on the chat for um, for. Sarah, you've just muted yourself accidentally, I think. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. It's great to be here today. I'm um, really looking forward to um, 
to, to sharing this research with you and, and hopefully that will spark some great ideas moving forward, not only in the workshop, but, but in um, your, your work. I'm just going to fire up sharing my presentation and we'll get back into it. And um, strangely, I've managed to get two screens ahead. How's that? Has everybody hear me and the present, see the presentation? Yeah, that was Some good. Fantastic. All right. So um, as Wendy said, Dr. Sarah Lambert, I'm at Deakin University in the research centre that focuses on assessment and digital learning. Uh, my research assistant, Habiba Fidel, has been working with me all through 2020, which was an interesting year to be doing research. Uh, luckily, our participants were um, increasingly Zoom savvy as, um, as we ended up, of course, doing interviews through all, all digitally. Um, so I wanted, first of all, just quickly touch base on what an open textbook is, going to show you some examples, and uh, then we're going to look at the, the research and what academics' um, insights were from different sort of disciplinary perspectives on the benefits of using those textbooks um, and how they can modify those um, for cultural inclusiveness and more local relevance uh, and also for um, better graduate outcomes. So let's kick off with this, um, this definition. So um, I've got to just, there we go, change my view. Great, so open textbooks are a recent innovation in free digital texts that can be distributed at no costs, printed at cost price, modified for local needs such as to correct gender, socio-cultural and Indigenous underrepresentations in the curriculum. And this last piece um, about uh, making the textbook better um, by making it actually representative of a wider range of communities is um, a really exciting uh, new direction that this research into open textbooks is, is going in. And um, this is where I think um, individual academics and their um, e-learning support staff can actually, when they're thinking through um, the technical development of digital resources, some of this work I think can be really useful thinking tools. If we're going to invest in better resources, more accessible resources, we can also think about what, um, you know, avoiding the kinds of stereotypes that make many of our students feel really uncomfortable uh, if they identify with the groups that are being um, unduly negatively impacted. So yeah, so open textbooks, there's a lot going on. It's, it's a free book, it doesn't have copyright restriction, but um, in the true sense of open, it's editable. And that means you academics, groups of writers have, have power to do interesting things. But it's a very digital thing as well. So it integrates multimedia. Uh, at the moment, um, Australia is starting to put its toe in the water with a platform called Pressbooks to do the digital publishing and outputting in different formats. And some of you may have some experience with that. And integrating H5P, that can be integrated into um, open textbooks and these platforms like um, Pressbooks as well. You can curate and put lots of digital components together. It doesn't have to be just text. And so, um, <laughs> Rajiv Janjiani, who is um, a great advocate from Canada for open textbooks, um, says that this ability to readily update and contextualise course textbooks arguably represents a new layer of academic freedom. As faculty are no longer bound by the limitations of the offerings of commercial publishers vis-a-vis -vis content, currency, clarity and cultural relevance. So let's have a look at this one. Um, I recently come across the catalogue from ANU Press. And this press is the first uh, and largest apparently open access university press in the world. They have hundreds of titles in their, um, on their website. All of them you can download in multiple formats for free. Um, you can see here we have an Australian introduction to Gamilaray, which is one of the numerous Indigenous languages of Australia. Um, Widha, and you can see from this screenshot here, yes, you can buy a print version if you want to have that but there's a free PDF or PDF chapters or EPUB option as well. And indeed, this is one of many, they have um, a whole series on Indigenous knowledges and topics, which is just great to see this kind of, um, uh, this kind of recognition for um, cultural strength and language of Indigenous people. 
So here's a Canadian example. This is business writing for everyone. And this has been produced on the Pressbooks platform. And if you're starting to see that, you'll see they have a similar sort of a template. So this is by Ali Crothers. And uh, what, what she's done is uh, quite interesting. She has modified an existing open textbook to make it more relevant for the Canadian context. And she's written an adaptation statement. I've put a link to it in the slides where she really acknowledges, um, you know, what she's doing with wanting to adapt this to the Canadian context. And certainly she has changed the names of um, the examples and cases in the book to reflect the composition of her classroom. So her students will be reading about people like them being professionals in the future. And that um, is a small but can be a powerful thing. Definitely she shifted to gender neutral language through the whole book. And she also introduced First Nations representation and recognition. And so she collaborated with an author and businesswoman called Brenda Fernie, and she is a senior elder of the economic development branch of the Kwantlen Nation, and she collaborated to produce a series of narratives that connect to the topic explored in this book. So I really recommend that you, you have a look at this book, have a look at the adaptation statement and begin to see that... Um, if we, if we broaden our idea of what an open textbook can do and why we would want to get involved, we can actually modify existing free works and make them really um, seamlessly integrating um, a diverse range of perspectives and communities who our students will be working in, uh, working with, providing services to, or maybe even identify with and might be part of that community. And that I think is a part of belonging um, which is an important part of students doing well um, at the university when they are perhaps not from the mainstream identifying group. So this is um, building on previous education as social justice research. So even though we're investigating the potential of open textbooks, we're investigating them as, as how the potential for social justice in particular. So yes, we want them to work for everyone, but we particularly want them to work for students who are underrepresented. So there's quite a bit of interesting research that we're building on in the USA, in Canada, in South Africa, in the UK, and some in Australia. And the social justice approach evaluates the impact of any initiative, like a digital learning initiative, in terms of the way that learners who by circumstance have less are able to be provided with more resources, more recognition or more representation, which typically they um, are not normally afforded. And so this research is part of a global conversation about widening access and success for learners who are historically underrepresented in higher ed. Uh, it's also part of a global conversation about inclusive education, which has got a slightly different background in disability studies. But um, one of the core messages around um, inclusive education is when you design for underrepresented students, all students of all cultures and all abilities benefit. And I think that's just a really um, powerful way to understand the potential of what something like a, um, an open textbook can do, particularly if it's been tweaked for that sort of local recognition. Um, there's not, I mean, this is a new area. Um, there's this one study in 2020 is um, one of the first ones to try and evaluate the impact of a textbook that's had that kind of cultural diversification woven through. And this was a project by Amy Nussbaum to diversify the content of the OpenStax psychology textbook. Now, I'm hoping you may have heard of OpenStax. They're a major provider of open textbooks and they have a huge catalogue of textbooks. Their um, introduction to psychology text is, is very well used in, in lots of different places, but it's pretty trad and it didn't particularly uh, do a great job of... Um, of representing um, the role of women, of uh, gay people and of black scholars in the field. And so there has been a project undertaken to put out a call for people to, to really enrich the content by making sure those sorts of knowledges and those um, expertise were included. And so straight away, you can imagine that this also brings the textbook very much up to date. 
So it's it's more than a nice thing to do. It's it's an ethically good thing to do, but it, it actually makes the contents more up to date. And that up to dateness is actually helping students be better prepared for the world in which they're going to be working. And that was, in fact, one of the key research findings that, that came out of the staff interviews, which we hadn't anticipated. I say it now, it, it sounds obvious, but it was something that wasn't understood at the beginning of this study. But in the case of this psychology text that was diversified in this sort of collaborative way, um, there was a comparison around belonging between first-gen students there. And so overall, those first-generation students had a reduced sense of belonging related to their financial circumstances. So, you know, when they looked around in the class and thought about if they belonged, they, they felt that they belonged less. They belonged in that class less than their, their um, better off peers. However, that effect of lack of belonging was ameliorated for first-gen students who read a diversified chapter, which recognised difference um, compared to those who read the original chapter. So this is, this is a really um, hopeful piece of research that points that there is um, an actual impact on students in how they, they feel about attending uni and, and their course. And I don't know if you saw it, but I mean, belonging you would naturally think if students feel a sense of belonging, they're, they're more able to um, feel positive about their work and, 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 and do well. But we just have had um, through the University of Melbourne, a study released just in the last week that has shown without a shadow of a doubt that if there is a lack of belonging because of students' diverse identities, they suffer higher rates of both anxiety and depression. So there is a, there is a, a a lack of belonging is a real problem for their performance. So um, it's great to have that sort of research out to be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that this, again, this idea of belonging isn't just a nice to have. There's a, there is a real problem um, with mental health if students don't feel a sense of belonging in the classroom. So diversifying their text can be one way to signal that you belong here and also um, in the profession that you're going to move into. So the research question was, to what extent do OER texts have the potential to act as social justice initiatives in this Australian higher ed context as they do overseas? And what we did uh, was 62 interviews. So 19 students at two unis were interviewed. And those are a mix of masters, undergrad, local and international. And then we interviewed 43 staff at five different unis. Um, key staff, libraries, e-learning, leadership policy and academics, teachers, OER adopters and authors. And we disseminated that through different kinds of communities. And so today I will be talking about the academic views from this study in particular. And um, they were really talking about OER texts as digital resources with a range of benefits for all students. They could very quickly grasp the cost savings and the free ongoing access for students as having an immediate benefit to all students, but clearly could also talk about the fact that that would benefit our disadvantaged students, distant students, parenting, first in family students would be benefiting the most. And that, and that is a good thing. They um, were beginning to see and talk about the ability to modify. Um, many of our academics are incorporating, wanting to incorporate local cases and diverse perspectives into their reading lists. Um, a lot of them were talking about reading lists that had ranges of different texts. There was only a few kinds of fields that traditionally just stick to one big text. So I think the Australian context is about multiple texts, not necessarily just one text. Um, there was a range of different ways they were going about um, these sort of curated reading lists and incorporating diverse um, perspectives with OERs, different digital platforms were being used. Um, and so there's definitely more than one way to go about it, which is great as well. And there was a lot of talk about press books gaining traction in Australia to author um, particularly new, new textbooks. And um, understanding from their perspective, as I mentioned before, that if if you incorporate, if you if you incorporate a diversity of knowledge perspectives, you are going to get a more up to date book, and that is also going to benefit all students. 
And so, yes, um, access, you know, free access is great, but in the social justice approach, it is way beyond, the benefits are way beyond just the free access. It's, it's about what's in the book as well. So, um, yes, they, they was, we're talking about um, the findings from our, actually both staff and student interviews. It's very important for OER to, you get a low cost a printing and a no cost um, provision of a digital book. And one of the big benefits to discuss there is overcoming this restrictive digital licensing that is increasingly an issue. Um, if students can't get a book from the library or the publisher won't give the library a license for e-version, then you know this is a sticky situation that we're finding ourselves in. And, and OER texts were um, increasingly seen as a really good solution um, around that economic problem of of um, access. But then, as I said, access to whose perspectives? Whose knowledge are we giving students access to when we give them a free book? You know, who gets to be an expert in the field? And so one of the key themes for, for those academics we spoke to in quite a range of different fields who were adopting or authoring texts was overcoming the issue of whitewashing in their field. So psychology, um, philosophy um, were, were two fields um, where we had very strong views from academics. There was a, a, an ongoing discussion in the field about the problem of how the, their uh, field had been developed um, out of a white Western tradition and it was slow to change and welcome people with diverse perspectives and how they needed to be part of that movement for change. Um, and so uh, making sure that students who weren't part of that white Anglo cultural tradition were welcome in their classroom, they also wanted to make sure they were reading works from, um, from authors of colour, for example, um, and that was something that they were actively trying to do. So when those academics are already having these discussions in the field and there's a sensitivity there, an OER textbook authoring model or a, a project that's going to support academics to look into that it was something that they were really could see, great, here's a concrete way we can really progress and um, improve on this. Indigenous and global cultural knowledges were often um, something that academics wanted to incorporate more into their curriculum but weren't really sure how and they could, you know, with this OER authoring could see that there would be a way to do that in the future. A number of people talked about improving the gender representation and that was sort of put forward as a given. It tended not to be a focus as much as the indigenization. I think that's to do with at the moment, it's it's quite high on the policy radar within Australian um, universities. Um, and I suppose what the student, what the research showed quite early in our conversations is that, yeah, the students, they do care uh, about how they are represented, if they're particularly if they're um, from non-Western cultures. Um, it's not at the front of their mind. Um, it became a conversation, but as, as that conversation proceeded, it, um, they do care if there is a lack of representation, but many said it does depend on the topic. So there was a view from the students and also from staff Look, maths is just maths, you know, chemistry is just chemistry. There's no people in it anyway, so you can't really have a diversity of, of, of views there. Um, but they felt that it was very important for anything where there were people, where there was social, where there was later or applied topics, um, where those foundational ideas had to hit the ground and be, and be applied and implemented. Um, most students provided examples of underrepresentation of women and Indigenous people as both authors and also as topics, like as, as within the textbook. Some provided examples of underrepresentation of Asian and non white people and uh, of Eurocentricism. Some also provided great positive examples of representation, but those were typically presented as exceptions. And so this confirmed that we do have a problem with um, 
uh, a kind of reinforcing of stereotypes of white male expertise in in textbooks, which isn't in line with the other sorts of messages that we're we're telling our students. And of course, you know, it's not all subjects and all books, of course, but, you know, we spoke to a range. So we think that it is something that's uh, certainly worthy to look at. So I want to read you this quote from um, one of the students. It's not representative of anyone. The photographs tend to be dominated by white people for a start and they don't look Australian most of the time. I think they just use stock photo library. And the content is very often very Eurocentric. So you don't get input from a lot of scholarly material that's out there from Asia or India. And there's an enormous amount of Indian work on you know, the topic they were researching. And so for some of our international students who had um, um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, some life experiences of gendered racism, uh, when we asked, you know, what's missing from your textbook, um, they didn't need any time to think about this at all. It was very much at the front of their minds, whereas other people with different life backgrounds needed to have an example before they could start to think this through. It wasn't something right there at the front. But for our international students, um, oftentimes there was um, quite a, a spark, you know, when we asked this question. So S07, student seven said, look, there's barely women are mentioned. It's all about the men. Even the textbook for retail management, which is a female dominated workforce did not have women visible in it. So I'm not gonna spend any longer time on that. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a slice about this is a real thing for, for a student's perspective. And there's a link through to um, a whole presentation where I expanded on um, the student perspective of what it means to them to, to have representativeness and recognition for difference, race, gender in their learning materials in the curriculum. And I think oftentimes it just, <laughs> was not front of mind for many of our interviewees, staff and students, but when we suggested, you know, have you thought about this or have you seen this, um, there was like kind of a light bulb moment. So one of the um, interviewees, this is a quote, what a great idea, I didn't think of that. And then the conversation just turned about how one could go through and just consider, oh, who, who am I citing in my readings list? And I wonder how that textbook is really positioning, you know, international students. So it just sort of lit a, lit a spark. So I think there's a great diversity of um, people are starting from a very low awareness for, and those who have more lived experience, I think of some sort of exclusion are kind of um, very much um, aware of, of the need. And staff are active and interested in diversifying their texts. So we found in the interviews many great examples of Australian staff working to diversify their texts, whether they're curating more diverse reading lists, um, whether they're adopting OER to bring the textbook up to date, whether they're authoring a book, uh, making it um, more diverse. And, and we had some examples of people who were writing both OER and commercial texts. And we did a national, um, a national online survey of staff. And so, yeah, 73% of those were interested in adapting for an Australian context and 67 were interested in adapting to do this uh, more social justice diversification. And 66% were interested in being part of a community to author textbooks. So we found that very encouraging and we hope that it gives universities and libraries who are thinking about running some projects, um, some confidence that this kind of work is of interest, it's timely, um, it touches some bases for staff in the digital delivery space, in the diversity inclusion space, in the belonging space, making things global, indigenizing. It's, it's ticking a lot of boxes for, um, for improving and making um, courses and curriculum more inclusive. So I think the overriding uh, new um, kind of perspective that came from this is that if we can help staff make their texts up to date by using OER textbooks, for examples, new little chapters, extra case studies, changing ones that already exist or even authoring new ones. If we can do that in a way that 
addresses this, um, corrects these under and misrepresentations, you know, takes out those sort of negative stereotypes or, or just lacks of having certain sorts of knowledges, we're going to update this text, we're going to make it up to date, we're going to make it an improved textbook where the, the, the skills and knowledge that students will leave with will really help them be better in their roles into the into the future. So, for example, um, I might just um, I might just pause at this moment and just see um, on my on my screen. I'm finding it hard to actually get back into the um, the chat and see if there's any questions and if um, the facilitator would like to ask any. Or hang on a minute. All right, here we go. I've just I've just stopped sharing for a minute to see if there's anything really troubling that I need to address before starting to share some examples. Uh, well, not at this stage, um, Sarah. I think people are, are are still really absorbing the the um, content of your presentation so far. There's been an interesting discussion about, and for me, I, it's not a perspective I'd personally thought about that much. The social equity aspect of making sure that the content of the textbook is is as inclusive as possible in addition to the access being you know as um, open as possible for students yes it does it, it's a more full fuller understanding of what we mean by social justice because social justice has an economic perspective as well as a sort of social and political perspective and so by bringing these two together, I think if we're going to invest in projects like this that are going to put time into thinking about what will we write and how will we write it and how we put it out, I guess I'm running an argument as, as an outcome of this research that's really worthwhile to do this sort of um, enriched perspectives at the same time because I don't actually think there's much extra work often to do it at the same time as we're going to do these sort of textbook publishing projects. Sometimes it might be more work if you wanted to put a group together, involve a community, involve First Nations people it would, you know, you can't rush those sorts of trusting relationships. But oftentimes, you know, there's a lot that can be done just by having an open mindset to, to the benefits of weaving that stuff in as you're searching. And I think librarians just have a huge role to play in supporting academics to find a more diversified mixture of things to, to curate together, you know, whether they keep it as a separate reading list or whether they're going to actually curate it in the one textbook kind of a format. So, yeah, so that's interesting. There's also hmm. been a, a bit of commentary about um, the, the use of English as a, as the standard, the, you know, rather than yes. a, a diversity of voices in terms of, of um, original language. So it's not really so much a question, but more an interesting conversation about how do we judge what is a good textbook? Yes, and it does depend on what you're trying to achieve, definitely in the sort of audiences. And the other issue that came up for us too, because we were thinking a global perspective would be what people wanted to get. But sometimes in a particular topic, for example, in accounting, the regulations for the Australian accounting, um, it, it, it can't be anyone else's regulations. You've got to use a particular, you know, um, set of regs have got to define what the content is in, in some particular things that have like um, accreditation outcomes it's got to be the Australian set that's the only thing that counts um, but then we had some other open textbook authors who were actually in the um, international campuses of Australian universities so in particular there was some authors some academics in RMIT in the Vietnam campus so their notion of what kind of um, cultural diversity was was missing was the fact that there was no barely an academic scholarly text with Vietnamese authors in in you know and so for them this was a gaping hole and a big problem um, they had lots of media but not really solid scholarly texts that they could show these sort of up-and-coming Vietnamese born students um, in the field so that notion of what whose culture is missing is going to change depending on a range of a range of things so it's 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 um include who's included and excluded is a nice broad question we can ask ourselves and the answer won't be the same i think it's important that we don't um, that we just ask that broader question when we're thinking it through absolutely all right i'm going to hit share again and get back onto some of these examples 
Uh, okay, I'm back here. Great. Okay, so so now some examples. So this is from Dr. Ben Whitburn, who teaches inclusive education at Deakin, and he has evaluated an OER text in 2020, and he's adopting it this year. And that one is published from the University of Southern Queensland's Open Textbook Project. So this is a <laughs> great example of um, USQ has been doing open textbooks for a few years. So they're quite um, ahead of the game and they, they are really well set up for that there. And um, one of their books is, is now gonna be taken up here at Deakin. And so when I asked Ben, you know, what's his motivation and, and how did this come about? He said, firstly, inclusive education is a fast moving area. The unit I was interested in drawing on an open access textbook was using a commercial text published in 2012. It's out of date. I had many of our interviewees say that they were really battling to get a current version from the commercial publisher. So it lacks a number of elements, he said, including Indigenous education. It lacks focus on curriculum. There is a great opportunity with OER text to pick up a resource that grows with the knowledge of the field. I really like that. It, 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 it's showing the the connection between thinking about what's missing and who's missing. In this case, it's Indigenous education and curriculum, but that, you know, by bringing that in, then that can, this textbook can more, can better grow with the knowledge of the field and become up to date. So the USQ OER text is downloadable in different formats and Ben uses um, a screen reader and a braille um, input keyboard. So the technical component of accessibility was super important for Ben and this one was was really great at that too. And I asked him how he went about evaluating that text and he said I went back to the learning outcomes and the assessment. What I did was compare both the books and compare one framework against the other. There is some content that's non-negotiable. A unit must have information about the legislative frameworks for students with disabilities. So that's another, we talked about that briefly. I ticked off bits of the material that I really like in the new book and I saw it was missing. And so the old book had a great chapter on the problems of naming and labeling people. And so what he was gonna do when adopting this new text is he would make up those gaps with papers and maybe even a few chapters from the current text. And because then he's only picking maybe two or three chapters that can be digitally provisioned under the, um, you know, the licensing kind of situation for a commercial text. So this is a, a great win for bringing the stuff up to date and making sure that no student needs to, they will have full access to that textbook from, from day one at no cost. So I mentioned, um, I mentioned that the interviewees covered different approaches to open access, different platforms and different technologies. And so this is a very different um, response. So I interviewed um, Kelly Menzel at Deakin Uni who leads the, um, the nursing program there. And the motivation there at the moment is this strategic driver to embed Indigenous knowledges in the curriculum Deakin wide as part of an institutional focus on implementing what's called Graduate Outcome 8 on global citizenship. There's a strong Indigenous component there. But Kelly didn't want to have to work on her own on that. And that was where they were at at the time I spoke to her. A number of the staff just individually trying to wrap their heads around that. Um, they wanted to develop special local cases of nursing in Indigenous communities that were completely lacking, absent from any textbook. And they wanted to do that together. They wanted to work collaboratively. And this is a cultural preference. She said that ties in really well with an Indigenous knowledge paradigm where you've got that collectivity of sharing of knowledge. And so what she's gonna do is just a slow and steady approach, starting with a small group of interested authors to publish mini cases, CC BY, Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial on a Deacon blog. So I've set up a, a new blog called Nursing on Country. And so after there's been some publishing of some mini cases there, you know, those could, because of the open license, those could be packaged up into a textbook or a textbook chapter in the future. They could be packaged up at Deacon, but also they could be packaged up by anybody because they've got, if they're going to have that CC BY on them. So someone who gets some resources and want to incorporate some Indigenous nursing case studies would, would have that capability because of the open license. So it's a really different approach, very light touch. 
um, using a, a, a sort of a common blogging platform that I think increasing numbers of people are kind of not freaked out by. Uh, so very different again. Whereas this example, we interviewed Dr. Joanna Funk at Charles Darwin University, who was teaching a cultural capability unit. Her approach, completely different again. She's actually working with students through the assessment process to write, to co-author um, textbooks together with those students, which is just amazing. So in this unit, there is... Um, I mean, it is a cultural capability unit. So they're, they're, they're teaching students how to think through issues from multiple perspectives as part of all the tasks, as part of all the assessments, um, really modelling that. She already has a reading list available online, already has that diversity of, of authors. She adopted an OER in 2019, but it needed a lot of work to bring it up to date. And she adapted it in 2020, working with those students who, as an option, um, what, um, put up their hand to publish their case studies, which were a major assignment. And so, yeah, they've now got like an additional section, at, an addendum to this um, text of, of these new case studies written by students and then quality assured by the lecturer who's also written and helped them write like an introductory to why this was done and what they mean by cultural capability. So that classic sort of intro chapter that defines the key terms that they're using in their case studies. And so um, that was, uh, as I said, just an option for students who are interested and that ended up in press books. And this is what it looks like. So this is a screenshot I took just a few months ago. So they've got a, a an introductory cultural cap capability in Australian case studies chapter and then chapter two, uh, three, four and five are the student chapters and there's a, a whole chapter devoted to references. Um, here's a different story altogether. So Dr. Keir Strickland was at La Trobe Uni teaching archaeology. He hasn't used open text yet, but um, hasn't found the right material, but is really interested in them and already has a really nuanced understanding of the need for both local Indigenous and global examples and already has a lot of Indigenous content there because graduates will most likely be working in that in that area in Australia. It's the majority of the work, he said, in um, in Australian archaeological science. And so what he's planning for and really wanting to get some time to do is to develop two open access core texts, which he collaboratively with his colleagues, which they could use across the whole course and maybe also could be used in other unis teaching similar courses that focus on Asian and Australian archaeology rather than the classical or European archaeology. And he was making the point that if you make a text like that, if it's open access, if if someone wants to adopt it, and even if they're only wanting to take, say, 20% of their text, there's no cost to the students. So, you know, they're going to, they can take those two chapters without having to, to worry about buying a whole book and then not getting the value from it. And that was another interesting perspective um, that was repeated by an academic in international studies who wanted to remain anonymous. And they said that uh, in this unit, this notion of representation wasn't like a, a huge aim of theirs. But nevertheless, they were balancing the need for global and for local perspectives. And in the textbook that they had written, they wrote about um, place, acknowledging Indigenous, colonial and migrant history. So again, just seamlessly woven through um, in, in the text. And so some of the chapters you have, have you almost walking with the author through Melbourne, past the library, narrating the colonial Indigenous history as you go along. It's a global book, but it's also anchored in the localities of the authors who are engaging actively with issues of gender and culture. Um, this is, again, um, what I mentioned before, um, an academic out of RMIT in Vietnam, really um, motivated by that substantial underrepresentation of Viet Vietnamese culture 
in textbooks and research. So while they rely on YouTube, local news and social media to provide current examples, they really would like to extend this to more formal scholarly outputs and hope to work with um, up and coming research students through their campus in the future. And open textbook publishing was something they were really keen to do. Um, this academic was informed by earlier experiences publishing a commercial textbook. And the publisher has just declined to update it, has just declined to put out a new edition and but won't release the text. So she can't, she can't have her own text back to update it and publish it elsewhere. So she's locked here with this commercial contract. She can't update her own text, but the publisher declines to do that. So she- Sarah, could I just jump in with a question? Cause there's a yes. bit of conversation going on in the chat yep. around motivation. Yep. Uh, really about, um, all of these interviews and these great responses seem to have come from academics who are already involved in OERs and how do we motivate academics who aren't so interested in OERs to invest that time? I think there's, um, we, the interviews that I'm sharing are concrete examples and I think that one of the things that motivates other academics is concrete examples. So having some stuff to draw on I think is really helpful so they can see one and go oh it looks like that this is something that's achievable but also in the um in the national online survey we just target anyone who is interested in digital teaching so we got a whole bunch of people who'd never heard of OER and um, they'd never seen an OER textbook so a more kind of representative of the, <laughs> the breadth of who's out there and um we still had very high um, ex, a sort of interest in um, if it was explained the benefits of OER for social justice meant you could the economic angle free to students overcome those access problems digital restrictions the cultural angle belonging in the classroom better for indigenous students better for women in the professions better for international students um, it was just like the light went on. So I think it's a matter of, of having, having those um, conversations and having some, you know, everyone being on the same page about those benefits being twofold and, and running, se running sessions for staff. And you're going to see that um, the other core point about is your text up to date? I think that's, this is what this interviews tell us. That's a huge lever. Staff are concerned about having an up-to-date text. If staff are not getting that, you could definitely run, you know, run sessions, you know, is your textbook out of date? What do you, do you want to do something about it? So that's an angle that you can work on. Um, do you want to Australianize your text is another sort of simple way that you can draw people to, into a conversation where you can maybe spend a little bit, a bit more time unpacking what that means. But is, sure, there's uh, a comment in here about um, mm -hmm. that possibly there needs to be more encouragement of peer review. Can OER creators across institutions team up to provide peers for reviewing? Is that yes. something that you've encountered? So um, like all publishing, there's differences in the models. But if you want to set up a publishing model that has peer review and then there's recognition through the through um, sort of promotions committee, I think everyone agrees that would be the ideal scenario. So yes, set that up and make sure that it's recognised with institutionally within promotion and probation, for example. I think you're going to get some good buy-in there because workload... Um, was a serious consideration. So yes, there's some institutional moves that would be that would really enable it. Workload recognition, um, some buyout, maybe some funding. It depends. Um, and then um, in terms of individual academics, up to datedness, Australianness. Just there is a, a chunk of our interviewees who are genuinely had it with commercial publishing. So you've got some latency there that you can you're going to pick up some people who just don't want to do it. They want to write something and they won't do it commercially. So you, you're going to have different people come to you for different reasons. And some of them will come simply because they're just going digital and they want to do it right. So there's the whole digit, you know, digitizing and going fully online type of motivation as well. Um, and there's the diversity inclusion angle, the indigenization angle. So you've got lots of levers and I think it's a matter of connecting the dots between them 
and just um, offering workshops and putting out communications that target people who are going to respond to those sort of differences, some technical, some e-learning, some I'm um, had it with, you know, commercial publishing. Um, I want to update my textbook. I, I want, I want to Australianize my text. Um, but when QUT did their, um, they did a press book pilot and put out a call for academics. They had some academics who were sitting on a text. They'd already written a text and the commercial publishers has gone, nah, now nah, we don't like it. It's not, we don't think it's commercially viable. <laughs> so there's some people with latency ready to roll, you may find. Um, also some academics prior to retirement who want that legacy project. They want to write that textbook, but they're really not prepared to sign their life away to a commercial publisher. So lots of um, potential, but different messaging does sure. that help I mean Sharon's some and stuff I think as funding and support are probably key factors and I think absolutely that's a pithy way of saying it <laughs> there there is and, and there are some people who are already just dedicated to writing those resources anyway and they're already doing it for example they might have some workload buyout to to renew their unit so there's a time when they already have some time it's a matter of getting the ideas to them because they've already been allocated time. So being um, being able to get into where uh, people are already um, doing their major course reviews. So maybe they do the major course review after five years and you can start to plan with them in that. And then as the review results come out, as I said, they're going to do some work anyway, bring these ideas to the table at the same time. Um, and maybe OER Techs might actually help them. I'll Okay, great. Sorry, I, I didn't want to stop you in full. No, no, this no, is we're this running is, out of time. Wendy's. No, no, yeah. let's stay here. <laughs> let's let's yeah. let's stay with the questions. I can just leave those PowerPoints. People can click through the additional examples. That's all we're dealing with there. Yeah. So I'd rather stay here with your questions. Yeah. Well, we're actually out of time, Sarah, and I'm reluctant to wind it up because it is getting into a really interesting conversation. I'm just wondering, are you happy for people to contact you? Um, via email with any questions that they may have. Um, are you happy for that? I can do that. I probably slightly prefer Twitter because sometimes Twitter? those, those, yeah, those sure. questions can then spark a really interesting conversation. If I haven't got a great example, some of my international sure. followers might be able to give you even more. Um, so, but if people are really not into Twitter, yes, of course you can. <laughs> but sure. Twitter would probably give them a better result. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, um, Sarah. It was a really, really interesting insight into your research and you can see by the, the conversations that we've had. Um, I think it's really important to have this information dispersed among the profession. So yep. you know, we can try and make a conscious decision to make positive representations in the materials we develop, even for our classes and things that we yep. actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, So, as well as make them accessible to all. So the Digidex group is currently... Um, playing in the OER environment. Um, so we'll endeavour, I think, to make sure that this is in scope when we're doing and creating and uploading things for sharing and things like that. So that may be part of our, our discussions coming away for this from the group. So, Well, that would be great. And I'm happy to chat about that into the future. But just, you know, library staff can offer to audit, help, help academics audit those reading lists you know there's some yeah. simple services that can be offered to just spend some time going is this really the latest is this really representative of what's happening in the field let's find some time finding some you know other kinds of journals that come from different places where this can actually you know lift up so yeah don't be afraid to uh to offer i'd say as well um when awesome. people come for that sort of how can we update um conversation yeah Thanks so much. Um, we'll share um, how to get in contact with Sarah in the chat. So we're going to go to a break.